So welcome to our first episode of Leadership Lessons from Business Crimes. In this podcast, I, Tammy, will be sharing a business crime story to my partner in crime, Ty. That would be you. Um, We may cover well-known or less-known ones with the goal of understanding what occurred, how it occurred, and most importantly, what we as business leaders can learn from them. For our first crime, we've selected a story that you may be familiar with, especially if you watch the documentary, The Inventor, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, which was on HBO. So let's start at the beginning. Back in 2003, Elizabeth Holmes dropped out of Stanford University at 19 years old to start a company that would transform the process of blood test. Elizabeth started working on a technology that, in theory, would allow for blood tests to be cheaper and more accessible to consumers. This would allow for blood tests to be performed on a more regular basis or, you know, more often, leading to the early detection and treatment of various illnesses. The concept was a portable blood analyzer that could quickly perform over 200 tests on a few drops of blood. And it really was, you know, a revolutionary process. It was, you know, revamping a process that hadn't changed significantly since the 1950s. With that idea, Elizabeth created Theranos. Theranos was able to raise more than $700 million through venture capitalists and private investors. They had partnerships with well-known companies, uh, Safeway, Walgreens, and Blue Cross, to name a few. Elizabeth was leading was a leading force in the Arizona law change, allowing people to obtain blood draws without a doctor's order. At one point in time, Theranos was valued at $10 billion. So what happened? Employees started expressing their concerns that prototypes they had been feverishly working on simply didn't work. Allegedly, any employee that expressed their concerns to management were terminated. Employees also claimed that the amount of confidentiality and secrecy within the company stifled full understanding of any issues and prevented collaboration in developing a solution. What I found interesting in watching this movie and doing some research was the fact that investors and advisors, all who actually are really well known, I won't name them here, but they supported Elizabeth based on their belief in her. Many have been quoted stating that they found Elizabeth to be extremely trustworthy, passionate, and brilliant. Investors gave significant amounts of money based on the trust and belief in the opportunity and their gut not on data, audited financial statements, or Elizabeth's business experience, which she didn't have any previous experience. Another interesting fact is that Elizabeth personally designed the corporate office with glass walls to demonstrate the high value of transparency. From this, from this one may con- conclude that Elizabeth was very honorable and a respectable leader. Former employees, however, have a vastly different viewpoint of Elizabeth's character. Some employees allege that Elizabeth promoted and supported secrecy and lies, alleging allegedly she would uh, change the focus of conversations regarding the failures of the machines to fight to finding creative ways to demonstrate that they actually worked. Some claim that Elizabeth was involved in every single detail of the organization, even interviewing every person hired at the company, no matter what position. Elizabeth was also alleged to have an intimate relationship with the president and COO of Theranos, which she kept from employees, investors, and advisors. Speaking of that president and COO, it was alleged that he monitored all employees' emails and even responded to emails that he was not included on. Theranos had signed a con- had signed contracts and deployed their testing machines before the, they were fully operational, tested, or validated. Once in the market, claims began to circulate that Theranos was using results from their own machines only a fraction of the time. Instead, they would use traditional lab testing processes and print the results on Theranos uh, reports, allegedly. The test results provided by Theranos machines were alleged to be inaccurate, and uh, which caused a lot of confusion and concern for the consumers. Even though all employees had to sign what some viewed as a very extensive NDNA, preventing them from talking negatively about the company or speaking to the press, um, some started to talk. Former employees went to the media as well as to the Department of Health, raising concerns about the company's practices. After three years of missed deadlines, questionable results, Safeway ended their partnership in 2015. A year later, Walgreens filed suit against them for breach of contract and uh, suspended the use of the machines. 
And Blue Cross also suspended the use of Theranos. So soon after, investors started uh, filing lawsuits. Theranos settled many of the lawsuits, and starting in 2017, they began laying off the employees. By April of 2018, they laid off most of their workforce down to 25 employees, which is a huge de decrease from the 800 at the peak of operations. In September of 2018, Theranos ceased all operations, which was communicated through an email to the remaining investors. Elizabeth also faced personally charges from the SEC alleging fraudulent activities um, and from misleading investors. She did settle with the SEC and she was required to pay 500000 forfeit $19 million of company stock, and was banned from holding a leadership position in a public company for 10 years, which would be roughly 2028. As of right now, Elizabeth is awaiting trial on uh, federal, a federal trial, actually, on indictments of, of a multiple counts of wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. If convicted, Elizabeth could face a maximum of $250,000 $250, and 20 years in prison. The trial was to begin in August 2020. However, it was delayed due to COVID. And in May uh, 2021, the trial was delayed again, as Elizabeth is expected to give birth this July. August 31st, 2021 is the new date for the trial, and we'll have to wait to see what happens. Elizabeth was meeting world leaders. Presidents of the United States had a seat at the table alongside other well-known CEOs. She, is, she was seen as a visionary, an innovator, and a leader in human rights. She had the ability um, to have people believe in her and, and her vision without one ounce of proof. And now she's awaiting trial, waiting, and we'll have to wait and see if she's going to be able to prove that she's done nothing criminally wrong. So while we wait to see what happens in the trial, what can we learn from this? So Ty, I'm going to kick it off to you first in terms of a lot of a meaty story. There's a lot of ways we can go on this one, but kind of what are your, your initial thoughts? Yeah, I think probably, you know, a controversial question that I would ask is, is it is it really reasonable for people to believe that anyone at the age of 19 can be the kind of leader that they were expecting her to be? Um, and I think, you know, because we have this kind of ethos in our culture that, you know, leadership is a thing that, and it's not necessarily related to age and, you know, but I would challenge that a bit. I mean, I guess when I was 19, I would have, I would have thought that way, but now that I'm more than twice that age, I think about it. And it's, I think, you know, there's something about experience and wisdom that comes with experience that plays into what I consider to be true leadership. And so, yeah, I would kind of kick it off with, with that question of, you know, shouldn't that have been the red flag right away to have such expectations, uh, leadership expectations on somebody of that age? Yeah, I think that's a valid that's a valid question, because in one way, I would argue that it's such a great type of story or a concept of someone who's super young with a great idea, who is willing to take, a, you know, a, a place where not many people have tried to change and try to lead and, and show that it can there's changes possible. But you're right, without any experience or, or the wisdom that age does, you know, kind of provide, could you yeah, I don't think the expectation should have been there that she would be able to lead. But maybe instead of that, could there have been better coaching and advising on that particular concept? Not necessarily in terms of throwing dollars, because I think that she was obviously able to generate and fundraise a lot of money, right? So maybe the, the thought should have been like, how do we maybe the help that she needed was yes, dollars for um, for research and for funding, but the coaching of how to be a leader, how to run and take a, an innovative idea and bring it into the marketplace. But instead, they focus on the fact that she was so young and gave her credit just for that. Yeah. And I think that I think also, I guess, getting philosophical from another angle of that, that might possibly explain part of that is that I think we often confuse business success with leadership attributes. In other words, is it really the case that business success is contingent on leadership? Now, those of us who care about leadership and the positive outcomes that can come with good leadership across the board in terms of the people being led and the benefits to the people being led's life, the business to the, broad, the benefits to the broader community of having good organizations with good leadership. There's a lot of there's a lot of possible benefits. Um, I I think I would argue that a lot of times we mistake in business success as being a attribute of leadership that. 
um, at least the way we often measure business success isn't necessarily. And I think it plays right into what you were saying, for example, because the counter, you know, if I simply ask the question, can you have business success at a young age? Well, there's plenty of examples to show that, that yeah, yes, you can in terms of like what you mentioned, in terms of can you raise lots of money for an innovative product at a young age? Yeah, there's lots of folks who've done that. Can you create an innovative product and sell it to somebody else at a young age? Yes. Can you can you create a product that has maybe viral uh, and uh, great um attraction to it such that the business sales are great that, that a lot of people are buying your product or service because of the uh because of the popularity of the product can you do that at a young age mm-hmm. uh yeah i think there's probably examples of that that we could find as well um and so these are all examples of business success but i think we we assume we like to think that those things are correlated to leadership that if you have good leadership that maybe you can achieve those things in business and I, I would say cases like this give us kind of a backward view of that to show, well, just because good leadership could lead to those positive outcomes doesn't mean that those positive outcomes in business imply that there was always good leadership. Right. Yeah, that that's a good way of thinking about it. The other thing, too, is I wonder because she was, you know, she didn't have the leadership expert, you know, experience and she didn't have that necessarily maybe development or coaching from, you know, folks on the sidelines, could that have forced her or made her feel like she had to do some of these things in terms of trying to make the the business a success to kind of cover up the fact that she didn't have the experience or that she needed to hurry up and rush to that so that she could demonstrate that it was happening through her good leadership that she thought she was um, kind of steering. Well, and I think, you know, when you talk about mentorship and the lack thereof, right, but we also know, as you kind of talked about in the story, that she did surround herself with a lot of well-known, famous people. But, you know, what's interesting about that, and it is in line with a trend that I, something that I often see is sometimes you get a certain kind of entrepreneur and, and, and actually I haven't necessarily seen this being correlated with being young entrepreneurs. I've seen this with older entrepreneurs as well, where you get certain kinds of entrepreneurs who, We'll bring in advisors or they'll, you know, and often they'll come to us. You know, we provide CFO advisory services. It's not uncommon that I get the call to uh, provide some kind of CFO advisory service or provide some kind of CFO uh, level work with the company. But as I start talking to the person, what I realize is they really don't care for my advice. They just want a CPA with a number of years of experience on their team Mm -hmm. so that it looks like they have advisors, but the truth is they have no intention of taking my advice anyway. You know, and and it's particularly when you're, you know, in the CPA world, that's a pretty big red flag of if somebody wants to put you on their board or wants to have you on their team or hire you as an advisor or a consultant or an employee, but it's clear that they actually, they're doing it because they've, they've been told, well, having that person on the team in some capacity can help you raise money or can help you with banks or can help you with uh, whatever it is that that they're trying to work past, but they actually don't care at all about your advice. You know, that I see, I, I've, I've, I've had run into that a lot. And that, that's what this scenario kind of strikes me. All of the people she surrounded herself with, she surrounded herself with a lot of, lot of well-known people. But one of the things that they had in common was they really, you know, and I, I heard this actually, ironically, the cloud accounting podcast, uh, colleagues of ours who put on a, who put on a podcast, they, they actually made reference to this just the other day. She surrounded herself with a bunch of people who had nothing to do with her industry, right? You know, generals and, you know, heads of state and, you know, people who really didn't have the expertise to really provide any kind of real mentorship or, um, or uh, help to her in that way. And, and that kind of suggests exactly what I'm saying, that she wasn't looking for anyone to provide advice. She was looking for people to add credibility to her plate. Yeah. So then lesson number one would be to, no matter what stage you are in and your leadership um, kind of journey, is to probably ask for that advice, ask for help. Because I think every, every leader could have an advisor, one or two, to help them support uh, them throughout their, their journey. So that's an interesting to point on, on that. The, um, the other thing that really kind of struck me as I was going through this, and I would love to get your take on, is so 
In terms of investing, so I would say everyone was really excited in terms of wanting to invest in this particular device, regardless of it worked or not. The idea of doing a, a whole new way of testing, which was you know going to re you know change the whole entire industry and allow people to have more ease and, and access, but without a actual validated proof of concept that it actually worked. How does one invest, or how should one inv- invest, or make that decision to invest in a company? company where it is a brand new idea and you really don't know if it works or not. How, what are some of the things that you can learn as an investor throughout this process? Because I would say from, you know, $700 million is a lot of money. So she obviously was able to, to raise it, but if that was all my eggs and I put it into this basket, it would not have been a great investment choice for me, obviously. So I'm just trying to think about that as, as we kind of go through, because that's another big kind of conversation that folks um, may be having in regards to this particular story. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a broader, I think that's a broader question because, I mean, in retrospect, this obviously wasn't necessarily a, a great investment, but in terms of the lack of information or the way in which investors came to this, came to this investment, it's, I don't know. I, I guess where I struggle on that topic is that there, is that I think investors come to a lot of private companies you know, in their different rounds from the seed round through, uh, you know, their different series of rounds. And I don't know that their information, you know, even if the company is not involved in some kind of fraudulent behavior, I don't know that the information they get is necessarily any better on average um, as a practical matter. And so, you know, really you have to narrow that question down to, you know, if you're going to be Kind of in a in a series, you know, A through C, you seed seed to series A to onward investor in a private company uh, before before you're talking about public company, um, you know, what what do you have to have in mind when you do it? And and you know those kind of folks to some extent they know they're rolling the dice, right? Mm-hmm. They know you know, and in fact, you know, firms that kind of collect people's money together to make those investments, they talk about. Uh, what they call the Monte Carlo model of investing, of making investments across multiple private mm-hmm. companies, knowing that the vast majority of them actually will not pan out, but one will be a winner and so on. And so um, it's, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a, uh, that that's a tough question in terms of what could you look for? You know, how could you make a better investment? I mean, in my perfect world, companies uh, investors would allocate capital, right? You know, investors, you think they one, the role they play in our society is that they have capital to allocate. They have capital available to bring to, uh, and that's what helps the economy move forward is that they allocate capital to projects that have the highest potential of, uh, moving forward and creating returns, which not only, uh, which creates, good things for the economy and society at large. And if investors don't play their role in a responsible way, then, you know, the, the eventual uh, problem with that is that, is that you, your economy is not going to be running optimally. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so in my perfect world, which does not exist, (laughs) I would say that I would say, yeah, it would be great if uh, an investor would get, more detailed information, more financial information, financial statements, uh, a better understanding of the technology of the pro of the companies that they're investing in. But I think I'm I'm putting a huge caveat on this in the sense that you know, with what I was saying earlier about this point, is that while we can look at the investors in Theranos and say, "Wow, you put a lot of money into something you really didn't know that much about," mm-hmm. the truth is. Most investors and most private companies in the tech space do exactly the same thing. Yes. So it's hard to it's hard to criticize the Theranos investors mm-hmm. on my from my standpoint from from that that point. And and I think also from a financial and business standpoint, what I'd throw out there for our audience to appreciate is that it's just a different game at that level because when you're working in a new technology, it's often known that you're researching and developing a new technology that mm-hmm. that the eventual final outcomes may not be totally known. Exactly what that final product may be may not be totally known. And that's known across the board in the tech world. And what the investors are doing in the initial rounds is they're investing in for the purpose of moving the company forward to their exit, 
which mm-hmm. still their exit may still not be the point in time when that technology is actually viable. So it's kind of a weird game because it's not what we think about in standard business, right? In standard business, we think, well, we invest in a company and we expect that company to have profits, which will generate a return for us. But that's not the game that they're playing in these kind of tech finance worlds. The game they're playing is we're investing, we're, we're investing in technology until the next person comes and takes the hot potato from us. And they buy us out and we get our return. And now they're, they're investing the next leg of the way kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I mean, I know just enough to say that, but not enough to, to really provide real value in telling people how I think they should do that game, because that's not the, that's not the real business game of we invest to create a, a valuable company that will generate profits. And then eventually, you know, those profits are what, um, we will feed ourselves with. That's not the game that's being played system wide. Right. Not just Theranos, but the entire system in that in that area. So, so yeah, it's hard to say. I think the dysfunctionality there is obviously readily apparent when there's a fraudulent situation, but the dysfunctionality is system wide, mm-hmm. uh, even when there isn't a, a fraudulent situation, in my opinion. Right. No, I think it's interesting because I do. I th- for the most part, most invest- investors are pretty, you know, quiet. And even for the documentary that they had done, they were, you know, asking them some questions and most of them are like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a deal that didn't go, you know, go well. And I think that to your point, they're investing in a different type of, uh, they're playing a different game than a lot, a lot of us, you know, are. And they, to your earlier point, I'm sure they did, they diversified, right? So this wasn't, even though collectively it's a lot of, obviously a lot of money, but I'm sure that they weren't betting the farm on it. However, I was a little bit surprised to see that the sum did, you know, end up filing in suit, you know, and, and trying to see, and that could be a, a strategy as well. I mean, who knows, you know, who did or who didn't, but yeah, I just thought it was an interesting kind of situation where, you know, so many before the big fall, which I'm sure this happens a lot of times where a lot of investors were coming out being like, I'm proudly investing in this company. I'm so excited because of this person and this idea. And then when it kind of fizzled out, they just, where hopefully let's quiet and let's not talk about this, where I do think that they could have probably get given some insight or maybe some shared lessons too of what they would have done differently. And maybe they wouldn't have, maybe they would have just said, I would have done exactly the same thing because it was a risk I was willing to take um, for an idea that I was, I was excited about that could or could not work. So. And I, I think, you know, a different bent on what we're talking about here is to ask the question, if you are, if you are a leader who is in this zone, like you're building a new company with a new technology and you're raising money, you know, does this game, as I put it, does it kind of force you into doing something that is, that maybe, you know, would I ever do that? Would Ty ever be the CEO of a startup tech company that is out there raising money with the, with the knowledge that we don't know exactly where this company is going and these investors could lose all their money. And I guess what would help me sleep at night, the answer to that question for me is, is, um, and, and it's the same question in terms of when people ask me as a CFO advisor to engage with their companies that I ask is, well, who are you raising the money from? Are the people that you're getting the money from, are they indoctrinated in this game? You know, are they, you know, or, are you know, and a lot of companies, they start out with friends and family rounds. And so, okay, you know, I mean, that I, I get that. I mean, who's going to believe in you more than your friends and family? That's, that's great. But at some point, I guess, my view on this is that uh, I would feel more comfortable as a leader in that space if the funding's coming from a VC or PE firm, because mm-hmm. to be cold hearted and frank about it, you know, if they lose their money, they, they're the ones who should know better. I mean, they know how this game is played. They know how to play it. They've got the resources to deal with it. So for me, it's like, you know, in terms of how do you operate ethically in this space, it's making sure that when, you know, when you're raising money for a very risky proposition, that you're not overselling it to people who don't have the capacity or the experience to understand the risks they're taking. Mm -hmm. And of course, the SEC has certain rules about that that will kind of keep you in line. But I've seen so many entrepreneurs and promoters, uh, to use that phrase, that are always trying to push the limits on that to get access to capital. And I I think to me, that's where I don't feel real great about it when, when when you see that's what's happening. You know, and it's like, yeah, if you if you want to play this game, play with the people who know how to play it. Right. Good. So the other thing that really gets me going on this one is the innovation piece, because I think that for most um, you know companies that are trying to be very innovative or be on the you know the leading edge of innovation, what 
everyone will say is it's very challenged. It's, cha- it's challenged to fund it. It's challenged. There's a challenge to see if it's actually going to work. There's all these various different things. And in this particular story, obviously there is one product <laughs> that made the whole entire company. So they put it to, you know, to market super, super fast before it was even ready. And you know, and and I've dealt with in terms of some innovations in R&D and trying to figure out, like, how do we try to put it out in the market? What's the right time? If we spend too much time testing and too much time figuring out if this product is going to work, then we lose our opportunity. So I'm, I think it would be a good kind of brainstorming or just talking point about the challenges of innovation and how leaders can kind of rethink about it or kind of come to the table with a different way to to, to view it. Yeah, I mean, I, I subscribe to the to the philosophy that uh, has been popularized in the in the tech community, and maybe maybe I'm late on this, and then people are moving away from it now. But I think it, the author was Eric Reese, who uh, talked about the minimum viable product, mm-hmm. and the idea with innovation is, you know, in, in terms of that concept, and this is a very familiar concept in the tech and software world, is you put out you put out the product that had that that is the minimum possible thing that could provide some kind of service or some kind of value to the customer. You know, even if it's not the thing that like does everything that you're trying to achieve, you put Mm -hmm. out the minimum viable product and then you innovate, you uh, iterate and innovate from there in a transparent fashion in collaboration with your consumers, with your customers and with your Mm -hmm. stakeholders. And I think, you know, what's interesting, you know, when you relate this back to the Theranos case, to some extent, that is what they were doing. They were putting out a minimum viable product that actually didn't do all the things they said they would do. But the great downfall of how they did it is they weren't transparent about what they were doing on that regard, right? right? So for all the talk of transparency, they were doing what every other tech company does They right now based on this idea of an MVP. They were putting out a minimum viable product, yeah. you know, and we see this across the board. You know, uh, I, I referenced the cloud accounting podcast guys, but maybe it's one of the, it's one of the few podcasts that I regularly listen to besides our own. And <laughs> I, you know, they talk about this uh, accounting firms with engineers. We also see this a lot with tech. I call it uh, service companies disguising themselves as tech companies, right? And it's a very common thing. It, I mean, that's not what Theranos did, but it's kind of it has a kind of a similar feel to it because what we see happening, like, and, and you could talk about it in our own space. You see companies that will start up and say that they're automating the accounting process, and for this one fee you pay per month, our technology will handle all your accounting. But in mm-hmm. fact, it's not technology handling their accounting. It's an army of people they're paying with venture capital funds that they're just burning through because the technology isn't there for them to be able to do it yet, right, mm-hmm. in some fashion. And and that's very similar to kind of what was happening here with the Theranos thing, right, is they were promising an outcome. They said they had technology that would achieve the outcome, but they didn't. So they were using, you know, if I kind of remember back to that story, they were they were using more traditional methods to kind of get some of the testing and the outcomes that they were trying to get and hiding the fact that that's what they were doing to some extent. Yes, but I think the challenge with this one is they were doing both. So they did some the, on their machines that were just inaccurate. So you have you have one where it's like you are using your prototype. And, and I think the challenge is, is that you're not disclosing or being transparent that it may or may not, there's a level of accuracy. So then you're getting a result back that says that you may have all these illnesses that you had no idea you had. And all of a sudden you're panicked as a, as a consumer. I think on the secondary side, they were using the other lab um, and other devices. But I think the, the interesting part is you would go and do your, the, the whole like prick of, you know, drop of the, the blood or whatever versus having a, a, a needle inserted into your arm and doing the, the, the testing the normal or, you know, traditional way. So people were doing both. So it, it's almost interesting because I think then that part, part is, is it's, it's more of the deceptive part of it because they aren't, they weren't using the machines all the time or they were using machines and they were wrong and you, you weren't getting the benefit of what this whole entire thing did. So I do see your point where it's like, yeah, for the most part, you're probably doing a, not all the bells and whistles of a new product to see if, if it actually can work, if it, if there's interest in it, if there's that, but you're transparent and you're honest, but do you, and to your example of the accounting thing, I think that's right. Like behind the door, someone might think that's all being automated, but what's the harm? The harm is probably nothing that they see because they're getting their financial information or things processed, but there really isn't, to them, there is truly not a difference versus actually having a difference in the end result of the product or even the way that the product is being serviced to you directly. So that's an interesting, I don't know, 
New yeah, hundred percent. You're right. I mean, the 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 public health problem with uh, the errors and deceiving people, the errors coming out of the prototype, kind of adds a whole new wrinkle to it. Um, I think the harm is the harm is theoretically to the investor community that the investor community thinks they are that customers are getting their outcomes through an automated process. Because when you go back, you know what is so interesting about this whole point is that that's that's the thing is that is that raising this kind of money, I think that's what this case has in, in common with with the um, service providers who claim to be using technology is that is that when you're when your company is set up to do something that has already been done before, and particularly like if all you're doing is providing accounting services or legal services or paralegal services or, you know, some other kind of service that there's plenty of other firms there, it, it would be hard to just go raise money for, right. you know, running a service firm. And I would suspect that if your business was to, uh, was a phlebotomy testing lab that was using traditional equipment and that's what you did. Um, it would be harder to raise money just for that purpose as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there you you might be able to based based on some things, but but in any case, not the kind of money they were basing. So they're raising money all on the guise of innovation that doesn't actually exist. And mm -hmm. I think that's uh, I, I think the the fact that what they were doing with customers actually put customers' health at risk. That's its own level of right bad right. But the, the issue in the Theranos case of raising money on the guise of innovation, I think that's rampant in the tech community. I think that's happening all over the board. So how about this, though? OK, I'm going to throw another little wrinkle on, on here. The examples of the, the, the Walgreens and um, some of the other uh, customers that signed contracts, so signed contracts to use um, you know, these machines, also built an infrastructure to allow for these things. So they had a, they in themselves had significant capital costs for something that they did not know didn't work. And so that's, to me, it's almost another talk about different learnings of that. It's like, who signs a contract for, for a lot of money on a product that you, that I, I don't know. I mean, I know that there was they there was that they said that the machines worked, but like, there's got to be some type of different ways to kind of look at that before you start rechanging your own capital structure of you know of like or a, a, a building or whatever to to allow these machines to come in and you're doing all these things and then it, it goes bust. Like they don't talk about that a lot because the focus is always on uh, you know Elizabeth and and the company, but I think that's also something to kind of consider. I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of those companies, I think the rational backstop in your mind would be, well, I'm working with another company. It's a business. They can't, you know, reasonably what they're saying is ha happening must be happening because the the cost of them doing it, it doesn't even enter your mind that they're getting the outcomes in a different way and that the capital that you're spending to to kind of hook yourself up to this system is worthless because there is no actual system. I mean, that idea, I think it would be, I could see making that mistake in my, you know, because you, you just can't imagine our, our mind doesn't automatically go there that, Oh, you know, the company's not getting the results they're getting the way they say they're getting it. Right. Mm -hmm. you, do, you know, especially if in order to achieve those results means the company is just burning unbelievable amounts of cash. You, you know, as business people, we just, we assume our counterparts would never do that. Right. right. And, you know, <laughs> but that is, we're assuming that's the problem. Right. And that's a huge assumption because I, but I think you're hundred percent correct. I think there was even not only the salespeople are, you know, the belief in her, but then you have like, well, all these other investors are doing it They're I mean, they're giving money. And so, and I think the other interesting part is that these other, you know, Walgreens, for example, I'll just use them as an example. They may have felt like we want to be first to offer this because this will help us grow as a company. This will help our services that we provide to consumer consumers. So let's let's hurry up and get on it. We'll be one. We'll be known as one of the first people that offered this. Um, and you know, unbeknownst to them, that did not pan out well. But it, it is a very kind of interesting. The pressures, I think, kind of all sort of start snowballing into this big, massive issue that, um, again, I think we the focus tends to be on that person, the one individual with the story. But I think there's actually a lot of different pieces to this, this uh, kind of mystery puzzle that is very interesting and we can all learn from. 
Uh, maybe the, one of the last topics, and um, this came through a lot in the documentary, but the whole fake it till you make it philosophy. Um, and, you know, in terms of whether the idea of individually pushing, um, you know, through until you succeed or until your concept uh, concept is successful or modeling yourself after other people who are known, you know, well-known leaders in the world and kind of emulating yourself to being like them. You know, what are your thoughts on, because there's a, a classic example in the story that she did follow other leaders and, and even to what she was wearing was very similar to that of Steve Jobs and all that kind of stuff of like, what are your thoughts on, that type of leadership um, philosophy. Um, yeah, I don't. I guess fake it till you make it is is. I think it's in line with some of the things I was saying earlier, in the sense that if you if what you're doing is presenting a fake picture of what you are and what your capabilities are, and then that's leading counterparties to make. Uh, investments in you that they otherwise wouldn't make. I mean, it's fraudulent. You know, fake it till you make it is just a, a fraudulent philo- a philosophy of fraud. If, if that's where that's going, right? I, I mean, I think it, the the little things, the the nuances of um, dressing like or sounding like um, other other leaders, mm-hmm. uh, emulating other leaders. I think that. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that's fraudulent. I, I think that using body language and things to to create that human perception that you have confidence and that you know what you're doing. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because I think if you look at that, if you look at the contrary to that, I think there's unfortunately a lot of people who actually do know what they're doing. But because they haven't thought about their body language or how they say things or how they present themselves, people, other people don't have confidence in them or they don't, they don't attract the amount of attention that they should attract. So in other words, I don't think it's a bad thing to have some kind of consideration for um, your, your style, your look, your sound and your presentation to mm-hmm. kind of make uh, make the best case you can for whatever it is that you're doing, because there are some things that are primal in human nature that we take as cues as to that cause us to believe and have confidence in, in people. And so I don't think using those things is nece- is inherently a bad thing. Not that I have a personal stylist, as people who've watched me on anything else will probably know, but but I don't necessarily think if someday in the future I do invest in that way, that that would be a bad thing per se. <laughs> yeah, but I think, so I have a hard time with this because I think that the, I do agree to your point that if, if someone doesn't have confidence at all, or they they come across as being very you know unsure of themselves, it is hard because you expect a leader to have a sense of confidence and be a strong presence in a room. I think on the flip side, though, if you're too confident and you come off as too strong or too assertive or too, you know, kind of have too much of a high belief in yourself, that can come off the wrong way as well, where it's like, it makes you kind of pause and question, like, you know, do you, you know, how, how is that going to be received by your employees, by the team, by the marketplace or by other folks on that? So I think that it is a very interesting type of thing. And no one teaches you the right level of confidence to have. So it is one of those things where I do think that it, the other thing I would actually need to add as well is that you have to remember she was 19 years old. So, in, you know, in order to like, to kind of, because almost in every story or or the documentaries will kind of point out the fact that she did, you know, trying to be somebody else and pretend whether it be her dress to her voice, pretending to be something that she wasn't. But at 19, she had no idea what probably to do. So what what are you going to do? You're going to look at role models and try to figure out and and not, it sounds bad, but role play into that type of leadership position. But I do think that there is a kind of a balance between how much confidence do you have or do you demonstrate in, in a and as a leader for, you know, cause I, some of the best leaders I have have been very, very humble, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm like, I know that they're the smartest person in the room, but they don't come across as like telling me that they're the smartest you know per- person in the room. So I don't know if there's a good way, if there is a good way to kind of learn that or balance that out as you're developing as a leader. I don't know if that's a question, but I, <laughs> I don't know where we go from there, but it is one of those interesting kind of thoughts of, of how do people learn on that? Well, I think it depends. And I think, 
I think this gets at the other issue with, you know, when I talk about that, we we're using the wrong metrics for leadership and time and evaluating people with business success for, for leaders is that, you know, is that, and I think this comes full circle back to my original comment of, you know, how can you be the kind of leader people were expecting her to be at her age? You know, I think the way you could be that leader. And I think about people who aren't in business, how can you be a business leader? I should say at her age and that, because I think about, and I don't remember her name, um, but there was the, the young woman from Afghanistan, for example, that is, you know, has shown courage and leadership in uh, standing up for what she believes in the face of tyranny that has, you know, that committed damage to her and threatened in her life. And, 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 you know, I think that, it's such a different thing because, and I think where the difference comes here and what true leadership requires is empathy for other people and for the desire to actually lead the other people, the desire to help other people in what you're doing and in, in your leadership of the organization. And I don't see, you know, I have a very narrow view of the story from having watched the documentary as you talked about it and, and reading some things, but I don't see a lot of evidence that that Elizabeth was a, really about helping the people in her organization, about trying to truly lead the people in her organization in that way. She was, you know, and I think that's what we often see from a lot of so-called business leaders. We use the word leader too liberally is what I'm getting at. We see a lot of people who are in charge of businesses and we give them the title of leadership when they seemingly actually care mostly about what is good for them and what they can do to improve their situation. And I think that's I think that plays into what you're getting at is that if you are spending your time and effort pretending to be something you're not, I think I think the question to ask is why are you doing that? Are you doing that for your benefit or because you think that somehow helps you benefit the people in your organization? That's a very philosophical question we could probably go round and round about, but I think that's that's what it comes down to is that if the thing if the things that you're doing really amount to how can you maximize your pay, your fame, your your lifestyle mm -hmm. and it's not really about how you can uh lead the people in that organization then then the title of leadership is not appropriate for that person um yeah that's that's a great thought and i think that actually brings us to a good stopping point in terms of, of where we are today because that's a great way to end this conversation um regarding elizabeth and and this the theranos story so We'll keep you posted. I mean, we'll obviously wait to see at the end of August what happens. Um, but I do want to give out a couple of special thank yous to Wikipedia, the inventor, uh, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, as well as the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission press release. All those, uh, so I use those as sources in terms of building the story. So a call out to that. And um, please feel free to, I know this is our first episode, so please feel free to leave comments if you're watching this on YouTube, like it, subscribe to it, all those great things. And if you're listening to an, uh, your favorite podcast app, please uh, like and subscribe as well. And please check out our other um, uh, YouTube and podcast uh, episodes that we do with Noob as well as Pop uh, Podcast. So thank you very much for joining us and I will hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Bye. Everyone.